Hello, new prospect. Welcome to RTB 2021 for July the 7th, 2021. Hope you're doing well this day. Uh, so we got some great takes for today. We've got Joshua 9, uh, Isaiah, I'm sorry, Psalms uh, 140 through 141, Jeremiah 3, and then finally uh, Matthew 17. Uh, so why don't we start with Matthew 17, since that's kind of the text we've talked about before. If you remember Matthew 16, what we had was the uh, event at uh, Caesarea Philippi, where Jesus identified himself. Uh, if you remember, um, there's a pattern that you see this in both uh, Matthew, really in all the synoptic gospels, but especially in Matthew and Mark, where Jesus will identify himself, then he will foretell his death because his death, his work, what he did for us is very much intimately tied with uh, who he is. And then he, um, then he will uh, teach on discipleship. Again, discipleship is becoming like the discipler. We know who Jesus is. He tells us who he is. And then he says, be like me. And so uh, identity is always tied to discipleship and discipleship is always tied to identity. So it's very important to understand, obviously, uh, who Jesus is and what he did so that we can become uh, like him in this case. Whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake, even as Jesus lost his life for our sakes, uh, will find it. So that's Matthew 16. But then we move into uh, Jesus has identified himself. But then we have the second major event in Jesus's life where God identifies Jesus. And that's at the transfiguration. And of course, this is where, um, you know, they go up on the Mount of Transfiguration uh, and Jesus appears with Moses and Elijah. Uh, again, uh, because both of those individuals were on mountains, right? They uh, went to Mount Sinai, uh, and they represent, of course, the law and the prophets as well. Uh, and so this is, uh, you know, representing, again, one, once again, who Jesus is. God comes forth and says, or sends forth his voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved son. Again, sonship is messianic language. Uh, in whom I'm well pleased, citing Isaiah uh, 42. Uh, he's the one who's going to lay down his life for his people. He is the suffering servant. So uh, putting those two chapters together, Matthew 16 and, and 17, we have Jesus identifying himself, teaching on discipleship, and then God reiterating what Jesus has uh, said. And again, from this point onward in the story, everything is moving forward to get Jesus's culminating work on the cross. So that's Matthew 17. Uh, we'll move to, uh, we'll, why don't we go to Jeremiah 3. Uh, so in Jeremiah, we have here, uh, again, Jeremiah is uh, focusing these first 20 chapters or so on judgment. And we talked about the two main images he uses. Uh, and he uses them again in these chapter, in this chapter, uh, same ones that he used in chapter 2, which is the image of an unfaithful bride. But what's interesting about um about chapter three, he talks about several things, uh, the pollution of the land that occurs because of the unfaithfulness of Israel. And we'll, if you read through Deuteronomy, it will often talk about how uh, the sins of Israel can bring pollution on the land itself. It, 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 there's a sense in which uh, the, this, this land that so represented the covenant relationship between God and his people could be polluted uh, by the activity of the people of God. Um, and, and specifically by things like adultery, uh, and so too, spiritual adultery on the part of Israel. The other thing that I think is really interesting about this passage is he, he switches off by talking about Israel and Judah. Now, remember, Israel is referring to the northern kingdom, the northern ten tribes of Israel, the northern ten tribes that, frankly, weren't in existence anymore. They had been taken into exile by the Assyrians in 722 uh, BC, and they no longer uh, they no longer were. There was never there was no longer an Israel. Um, Judah was the only one left. Uh, so why does Jeremiah bring up Israel? Except that I think, like for instance, for instance, in verse 11, uh, it's to shame Judah. Uh, here we have this nation, the northern ten tribes of Israel, who never followed God, really. Uh, from the time that they divided, from the time you had that split between the northern tribes and the southern tribe of Judah, uh, in 931 BC, right after the, um, the reign of King Solomon, when Rehoboam, Solomon's son, took over and the 
the, the nation split and you had the Northern Kingdom and the Southern Kingdom, from that point onward, the Northern Kingdom never was uh, faithful to God. And yet, um, and yet here we have Judah, who's about to experience God's judgment in the Babylonian exile. Judah is being compared to them. It's almost like, um, you know, if you're being compared, if, if we as a nation were compared to North Korea, or if we as a, uh, you know, if your parents compared you to the, the guy at, as a child, if you're misbehaving, compared you to, you know, a, a, another child that was well known for misbehaving or something like that. I, I think that's kind of what's going on here. But intermixed with all these um, judgments, you will find that Jeremiah will, will show signs of hope. And that's what we find, for instance, in verse 15, uh, that there's hope and hope is tied to repentance, uh, a return. So if you have gone after other, um, other, other gods or other nations that committed that spiritual adultery and you have gone in that direction, what is your hope? To turn and to turn back to God. This is the idea of repentance, right? Is going one direction and going back in the other. And that returning um, would be to return to right covenant relationship with God. And how will that happen? It's, it'll be when God gives them shepherds after his own heart. Of course, obviously that's a reference to, to David. So this is a mess. This is a messianic language. Uh, so it's referring to one day when God will restore all things will for his people, when he restores his people, it will be intimately tied to God restoring the kingship uh, and having a king who will, in fact, be after God's own heart and feed them on knowledge and understanding, will live out wisdom before them, would live out righteousness before them, uh, because God judged the people through the lens of the king. And uh, so this is the hope of Israel, isn't it? And Jeremiah here, even in chapter two, even so early on in his book, is promising that kind of restoration. Uh, but it's ultimately tied to verse 22, to their return of the faithless sons, Jeremiah 3. Um, let's move on to Psalm 142. What was it? Psalm 140 and 141. Yeah. So we have here two, uh, two Psalms of David, and they are also individual laments. So if you remember uh, a, a week or so ago, I preached on Psalm 13, which was an individual lament, and it has that very typical uh, progression. And these have a, have a pretty typical progression as well between the, um, the, the crying out to God, and then you have the specific complaint, and then you have the petition on the part of the person uh, who is undergoing this, in this case, David, and then there's that confession of confidence and hope. Uh, and so that's what we have here in these two uh, chapters. The, the, these two Psalms are lamenting different things. Uh, the first one is lamenting uh, violent men. Uh, in fact, in verses one and four, you have that repetition of the phrase, preserve me from violent men. So here's that petition very early, very early, early on in the Psalm, the, the crying out to God for help, uh, preserve me from these. So that's it's, it's a very immediate enemy here uh, that David is facing. Um, but then he, he ends by confessing that the Lord will maintain his cause, uh, not just his cause, but the cause of the poor and the afflicted. Um, and so he, he ends with the expression of confidence in God. Psalm 141 is an interesting uh, twist to a typical lament because uh, he's asking not just God to guard him uh, from enemies, but also to guard him from his own self almost. Look at verse three, set a guard over, over my mouth, keep watch over the door of my lips. Oftentimes, isn't it that uh, we do face enemies from the world, from the devil, uh, as Paul would say, the world and the devil, but we also face enemies from our own flesh, from our own selves. Uh, we can be our own worst enemies sometimes because we're still battling with that old nature, aren't we? Um, and so we need to be praying, even as the psalmist does, to set a guard over his mouth, over his lips, because the, those things often portray what's inside of us, and also not only what goes out from us, but what's inside of us, do not incline my heart to any evil thing. Uh, what an awesome prayer on the part of the psalmist, uh, and a humble prayer, too, uh, to rec recognize his own uh, proclivities towards sin uh, and failing in that way. 
That's Psalm 140, 141. And finally, we've got Joshua chapter 9. So uh, we just had the conquest of Ai and then the, re, the uh, reaffirmation of the covenant uh, at Mount Ebal and um, Mount Gerizim. Uh, and then we have here the Gibeonites. Uh, this is always a, a kind of a fun story because uh, now the Israelites are kind of fighting against multiple coalitions of people as they go into the promised land. Uh, and the Gibeonites are fearful that they're going to be destroyed. And so they trick Joshua um, by basically acting like they're coming from some far distant land and they want to make a covenant with him. And, and so they, make, they end up tricking them, giving, making a covenant with Israel. They end up being their slaves, but at least they're not wiped out. Um, and then this becomes a stumbling block for Israel later on as they are forced, because they have a covenant relationship, a treaty with the Gibeonites, they have to end up defending them uh, later on in the book of Joshua, in fact, in, I think in the next chapter. So um, bad move on the part of the Israelites. In a book that's filled with mostly Israel following what God has called them to do, here's an example of them kind of tripping up and why. And I think, remember what... This is not just a book, Joshua, is not just a book of history. It's not just to tell us the events so that it can inform our, our minds on what happened um, and how Israel became, how Israel conquered the promised land. It's not just an informative book. The Jews considered Joshua through Samuel, Kings, Kings, and Judges, Joshua, Judges, Samuel, and Kings, to be the former prophets. In other words, these are words from God to conform us to covenant relationship with him, uh, to exhort us even. Uh, so it's exhortation through the means of narrative. And this is often done through selection by selecting to include different details. And I think the key detail of this whole chapter, which would be an exhortative thing for the people of Israel long after Joshua uh, was written and an exhortation for us too as well is verse 14. So the men of Israel took some of their provisions and did not ask for the counsel of the Lord. In other words, they did this covenant, this treaty with the Gibeonites, which ends up becoming a stumbling block for them. And the reason why they did it and the reason why it turns out poorly for them is because they did not take counsel with the Lord. They did not consult him before they made this treaty. Uh, moving forward, without seeking the Lord's counsel, becomes a stumbling block for the people of God. That's individually and that's corporately. And so here's this little detail included in Joshua 9, which I think would be an exhortation, not just to Joshua's people during that time period, but also for everybody who ever reads this book, including us. Uh, so a good exhortation, I think, to end on, on this day, July 7th. Uh, 2021. Always seek the counsel of the Lord. Hope you have a great rest of the day.